morning church morning uh, today's teaching text is jude 20 to 25 verses 20 to 25 and i'll be reading from the christian standard bible it reads as follows exhortation and benediction but you dear friends as you build yourselves up in your most holy faith praying in the holy spirit keep yourselves in the love of god waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ for eternal life. Have mercy on those who waver. Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to protect you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Like I said, fam, it's our last week in Jude. A short series, short letter, but dense and powerful. Nonetheless, uh, just by way of introduction, re- let me recap. It's a letter by a man called Jude. He's the half-brother of Jesus, and he's writing to people like you and I, Christians, his brothers and sisters in Christ. Why is he writing to them? Because people have been lying to them, and they've been teaching false doctrines in the church and in different churches that Jude had leadership responsibilities over. What does he write about? Look at the map. This is a breakdown of Jude according to the Bible Project. He writes... And he says, you need to contend for the faith. He ends by saying, you need to contend for the faith. And he ends with a word of praise. That's like a summary of the book. This was week one for us, verses one to four. Last week, I covered five to 19, and today is 20 to 25. These maps are really useful and awesome. You can find them on thebibleproject.com. So he says, contend, contend, and praise. Basically, what Jude says in South African English vernacular, is stay true to the gospel, stay true to the message, get the basics right and go back to the basics. Jude also says, like you full well know, that choices actually matter. Jude says that obedience to Jesus is key. Like that's the gist of the whole letter. So please do catch up on week one and two if you missed it. Today's theme is hidden in God's love. And I really have one simple question for you, and that is, do you know how to keep yourself in the love of God? Verse 21. Do you know how to keep yourself in the love of God? The reason why this is an important question is because that's the main thrust of Jude's final charge. Keep yourself is the command. It's the imperative. And he says, keep yourself hidden in God's love. In our vernacular, stay close to Him. Stay with Him. Stay in relationship with Him. Be in Him. Be closer than close to God. Be closer to God than your next breath is to you. That's what he's trying to articulate. So how do we do it? How do we keep ourselves hidden in God's love? There's our roadmap for today. Intimacy with God. Intimacy with others. And by praising Him. Intimacy with God. Intimacy with others. By praising Him. I-I-P. Intimacy, intimacy, and praise. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we believe that your word is alive. We believe that your word speaks to us here and now. We believe that your word is really, really sharp and that it penetrates the deepest parts of our being. We believe that your word transforms us and we believe that you have a word for each of us today as we open it up and as I preach what we found in you. Lord Jesus, I pray that the words of my mouth would be acceptable unto you. I pray that you would anoint my lips and that I would speak only what you would have me speak. I pray that our minds would be illuminated, that we would experience intimacy with you and with each other, and that we would be compelled to praise by this message. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would do a great work in us. Shape us into your image. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, so how do we keep ourselves hidden in God? Well, intimacy with God is the first way. Look at the slide. And I want you to look at the highlights on the slide. They are really, really, really important. Now follow 
Jude's logic. Keep is the imperative, right? So verse 21, there's your command. That's what you ought to do. And that is keep yourself in the love of God. Okay, so how? By building, do you see the word? By praying, do you see it? And by waiting. Okay. Now, three great words. Let's just pause for a second and think about them. Building is hard work. You can't build something by doing nothing. Like building requires effort, requires action. Praying, according to the Bible and according to me, should be one of the easiest things to do. But somehow, we often say that we find it difficult to pray. It's not supposed to be like that, but it is. And let's talk about waiting. Who loves waiting? Who gets impatient while trying to wait? You know what I mean? Like it's really, really hard to wait, but that's what Jude says. So the way you keep is by building, praying, and waiting. What do you build with? Do you see the words faith and love and hope? It's right in there. Okay, that little triad of the early church. The Apostle Paul penned it in his letters, faith, hope, and love, or faith, love, and hope. Jude says you build by faith. Do you see the highlight? You build by love. Do you see the highlight? And then waiting expectantly for eternal life. That's hope. Okay. So we keep by these three things. We build with these three things. What do we focus on while we keep and while we build? Check the highlights. The Holy Spirit, God, and Christ. Come on! Where in the Bible do you find the Trinity? It's right there in a really, really small letter, right at the end of the New Testament. Do you see it? I mean, how dense are these two verses? So the Trinity in its fullness should be your focus. As you focus on them in faith, love, and hope, you build. And as you build, you pray and you wait, you keep. Now what's the key to this whole thing? The key is praying. Do you see it? I want to ask you a real question, and that is, do you pray? Do you pray? Because prayer is the key to intimacy with God. You know that intimacy changes you. You know it. You know that when you really know someone and they really know you, there's a deep connection between you. And you know that that deep connection changes that relationship. The relationship grows, it goes deeper, it becomes fortified, it's more special. The same thing happens to us and God when we pray. Do you know that? So why would you pray? Because, there's a highlight that I haven't mentioned yet, you are God's beloved. It's translated in this translation as dear friends. But in Greek it's one word. Agape toi. The ones who are deeply loved. Fam, that's great news to you and I this morning. It shouldn't go over your head or it shouldn't not penetrate your ears. Listen, God chose you. He gave the gift of faith to you. He invited you into a relationship with Him. He pursued you. He came after you. He declared His love for you by being nailed to a cross. This is good news. Through Jesus Christ, this is all true. Through Jesus Christ, we are God's beloved. Through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, God clearly communicated that He loves us and that we are His beloved that's why you pray. The Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2, we're going to read it as our benediction, we were saved by grace through faith. 
God gave. And if you are a Christian, you chose him back. Do you realize that? So you are his beloved. He did all of this for you. When you came to faith, you said, God, I see that you chose me. I see that you love me. I am now choosing you back. Let me use an illustration. Can you guys imagine if my wife only ever talked to me when she felt like it? Just think about that, right? So in our marriage, I asked her to marry me. So I chose her, and then she said, yes, she chose me back. Can you imagine if she would only talk to me when she feels like it? And when she speaks to me, can you imagine what it would be like if she keeps it really short? One-way communication. And all she ever told me was the list of her needs. And then after she's told me what she wants and needs, she carries on however she wants to. How do you guys think that marriage will work? Do you guys think that I'll be happily married? I think there's a deeper question there. If that was the case between my wife and I, do you know what the real question is? The real question is, are we even married? Think about it. Because I asked, she said yes, so both of us are supposed to live according to this reality. But it's not reality. So are we even married? Do you pray? And the deeper question under do you pray is, are you a Christian? Because if you don't pray, you can't be a Christian. Because identity precedes activity. Think about this. You first are, and then you do. But the do will show who you are. I am a runner. Okay, great. Do you run? No, never. No, I don't. So how can you be a runner if you never run? How can you be a Christian if you never pray and you are never intimate with God and you never talk to Him? How can we be married if we never talk to one another and it's only ever one-way traffic? Do you guys see the illustration? Prayer is the key. Do you know that you are beloved? And do you know you are beloved according to God's call? That's great news. It's not circumstantial. It's not subject to change. You guys know what it's like when you read something and there's a little asterisk that says it's subject to change. That means it's like this now, but it can change later. God's love is never like that. And our beloved identity is never like that. So, our drive and our urgency for prayer also shouldn't be circumstantial. And it also shouldn't be subject to change. It should always be there. Because when it is, we are hidden in God's love. It's a good time to call on Jesus here, right? So we've heard a lot about Jude. Let me read you something that Jesus said. As the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Do you see that? There's proof that you're God's beloved. And now Jesus says, remain in my love. Jude's words are, keep yourself in the love of God. And how do we know? Well, if you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Right, so it's first identity, then activity, but the two things go together. Do you see it? So keeping yourself hidden in God's love starts with intimacy with Him. I want to ask you a few difficult questions. Do you know how to be intimate? Do you know how to be honest? Do you know how to be vulnerable? And do you know how to be authentic? This is the place to learn it. And that's in a relationship with God. Why? Because you will find perfect love on the other side of that relationship every single time. So you might hear it. You might feel like you've got no idea what it's about. Well, enter into it and experience the great mystery of having, intimate, having intimacy with God, the creator and the sustainer of everything. Because He's awesome. 
And He's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. And you'll find perfect love on that side. So if you struggle to be intimate, start with Him. If you struggle to be honest, start with Him. If you struggle to be vulnerable, start with Him. If you struggle to be authentic, start with Him. That's how we keep ourselves hidden in God's love, is intimacy with Him. Second point, intimacy with others. And that's found in verses 22 to 23. Now, before we unpack verses 22 to 23, let's just read Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 5. It's a passage in the Old Testament, taken from the book of the prophet of Zechariah. Now, Jude draws on this imagery. He knew the book, and his crowd knew the book, and I don't know if you know the book. So let's just read the book first that he quotes, and then we'll look at what he says. So Zechariah 3, verse 1 to 5, this is a vision that the prophet sees. He says, Then he showed me the high priest, Joshua. This is not the Joshua from uh, um, the book of Joshua. This is another Joshua. Then he showed me the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord, with Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. May the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Isn't this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. So the angel of the Lord spoke to those standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to him, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with festive robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So a clean turban was placed on his head, and they clothed him in garments, while the angel of the Lord was standing nearby. Fascinating passage. So remember, Zechariah is a prophet, which means that by God's grace, he gives the prophet a perspective on what he sees, right? So it's a human on earth, but all of a sudden finding a godly perspective on earthly things. And the prophets then interpret the things that they see, they give meaning to it, and then as they give meaning to it, it becomes a revelation of God and His ways, okay? So that's what, where this passage comes from. Now, let's go back to Jude, verses 22 to 23. Look at it with me. The first thing that Jude says is, have mercy. Why? Because they stand accused. Who are they? Well, those who waver. Do you see it? So he just drew on the imagery of the prophet, saying that they stand accused. Have some compassion on people. Have understanding for what it feels like to be accused. Humble yourself and remember that you also sometimes stand accused. Does anyone know the feeling of standing accused? And being lied to and believing those lies? I know the feeling. So you need to be in tune with your own stuff to have mercy on someone else that is standing accused. If we have people who waver, I'll say something about waver now, and we have mercy with them, then those people have a tangible experience of what they will find from God every time. Do you see it? Because God is full of mercy, and if we are full of mercy, people experience something of God through us. Wednesday night we had city group, and we sat around our dinner table, and we said to each other, it should be possible that around this table, that one of us can say, I am on fire for God. Chowing His Word, loving it, receiving a revelation, and praying like a machine. And the person right next to you should be able to say, I'm really struggling at the moment. And I'm not praying at all. And I actually don't want to read my Bible. And I'm really doubting. And we should be able to hold both of those things. Do you see it? That's what Jude says. Have mercy on those who waver. Waver can mean multiple things. It can mean people who doubt. It can mean people who are just really struggling with sin. It can even mean people who are unrepentant. People who sin and they acknowledge that they sin and then they don't change. Jude says, have 
mercy on those. Why? Because they stand accused. And as they stand accused, they feel filthy. And as they feel filthy, they are stuck in that trap of the enemy accusing them. So have mercy on them. I mean, have you ever had that experience? I really pray that as Christians we should. Because around that table, in this family of God, there should be no condemnation. There should be mercy. Okay, so he says have mercy. But then look what he also says. Save others by snatching them from the fire. In the prophet Zechariah, he says, can't you see that Joshua almost burnt? He almost didn't make it, but he was snatched from the fire. So he's got some wounds, but he's definitely not dead. So Jude says, save people from the fire. So those who are to be snatched from the fire are church members who under the influence of these false teachers, are indulging in sinful behavior and loving it. But they will repent if their error is pointed out to them. And it's not necessary for Jude to explain to, uh, to the people reading his letter how to do it. Why? Because it was understood everywhere in the early church that if someone makes a mistake, you rebuke them and you warn them in a spirit of brotherly love. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 18, Luke chapter 17, Galatians chapter 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 Timothy 5, Titus 3, and James 5 all explain that we have to rebuke each other and that we have to warn one another and that we have to do it in a spirit of brotherly love. All those passages say it. So Jude says, save others by snatching them from the fire. And I don't have to tell you how to do it. You know that you do it in love. So when we rebuke each other and when we warn each other, this is not judgment. It's real care. Why? Because behind the rebuke and behind the warning comes a heart that says, I don't want you to go to hell. Do you guys understand that? I don't want you to die. And I, want to, I don't want you to live a life of death if Jesus Christ gives life and life in abundance. Everlasting life that starts now. If I see something and I don't rebuke and warn, I believe that I actually then don't care. I could say I care, but I don't. Jude says, snatch them from the fire. That's real intimacy. It's going there in relationships. Question. If you struggle to have intimacy with people, how often do you go there? And how often do you let people go there with you? Because that's the key to intimacy. is allowing people to go to those deep places with you, but then also going to those deep places with people. Okay, so he says, have mercy, and he says, save others, and then he says, have mercy again. But then he uses two different words. He says, with fear and hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Okay, Whew. serious stuff. Here's what he says. Have mercy with fear means this is serious stuff. Take this seriously. He says, this is life and death stuff. This is abundant life and steal, kill, and destroy stuff. So take this seriously. That's what it means if he says, have mercy with fear. So you have mercy, but with a vivid reminder of what you want for someone and not from someone. It's not about having mercy with someone so that they can have it back with you when you need it. No, it is about having mercy with someone and then being serious about the filth that you see. Do you get that? I don't want you to be stuck in a life of sin. I don't want you to miss the abundant life that Jesus gives. I don't want you to miss your life's purpose or the role that God has destined you to play. I don't want you to miss living out God's will. So what I want for you is the reason why I warn and rebuke you and show mercy to you. Do you see it? It's not a payment system. It's not making mercy deposits so the day that I need mercy, people can show it to me. No, it's about having a heart for people and wanting to see them live the abundant life that Jesus gives us. So, 
If we want people to live the abundant life that Jesus gives us, we have to be serious about the things that make them dirty. And that's what he says. Hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. The literal translation is hating the garment soiled by the body. That's what he's talking about. When was the last time you had a real, vivid experience of someone soiling themselves? I know it's a really difficult question, but we need to go into that space. Yeah, of course, yeah. Play the parent card right there. Here's the thing. If you see someone who soiled themselves, it activates two things from us. It activates mercy and it activates action. Yeah? So the reaction to someone soiling themselves is, it's okay, there's mercy, let's get you cleaned up. Do you see it? That's the imagery that Jude uses. So if your life is dirty and defiled, it's okay, but let's get you cleaned up. Why? Because if we don't get you cleaned up, you'll stay soiled. And you'll believe all the accusations and shame that come with being soiled. Do you guys see it? If anyone would be soiled in front of us now, they would feel a lot of shame. The way to fix that shame is by cleaning it up and putting new garments on them. Do you know how many people walk around in Centurion with soiled clothes? This is metaphorically speaking now, not literally speaking. Do you know how many people in Centurion walk around standing accused by the enemy in soiled clothes, not knowing that there's good news for them? We have good news for them. We have the answer for them. We have the place to get clean clothes. We have the truth to refute the lies of the accuser, fam. Remember how amazing grace was the first time that you really understood it and that it spoke to your heart. We have to tell others about it. That's what Jude says. Save them and hate the dirty garments. This is intimate stuff. This is one of the reasons why we hammer so hard on community in this church and being plugged in, being connected and being known. Because who will help you change your clothes if you fly solo? Think about it. You'll be dirty and defiled and no one will be able to say, it's okay, let's get you cleaned up. We need that. There's no such thing as a solo flying Christian. How do we keep ourselves hidden in God? Intimacy with God, intimacy with others. Let's finish with this one. By praising Him. The first part of Jude's uh, end to his letter, it's called a doxology. It's called a praise word or an ending of praise. Check this. The first part of his doxology, if we can just have 24 and 25 on please, Rudolf, is a confident prayer that God will preserve His brothers and sisters from the spiritual disaster with which the false teaching is threatening them and He will bring them safely to the end. That's the prayer. right? So Jude says, I am confident that God will see you through and that He will keep you safe and that He will protect you from stumbling and that He will make you stand in the presence of His glory without blemish and with great joy. In the previous section, Jude continues, he spoke about what people are supposed to do. Now Jude assures them of the divine support and protection without which all of their efforts will lead to nothing. God is there, He's by your side, Jesus is there rooting for you, you've got the Spirit in you. I am confident, says Jude, that He'll take you through the end. Let me show you a picture. This is a picture of my brother and I at the Comrades Marathon of 2023. Kings Mead Stadium. We are about 30 meters from the finish line. Can you guys see my eyes? Can you see how intently focused I am on something? Can you guys see my brother? I'm left, he's right. 
Can you see him pointing? Can you see him smiling? Do you guys know what we saw? We saw our people. We saw our supporters. My mom, my dad, and his wife. Well, not my dad's wife, my brother's wife. <laughs> so we were headed to the finish. We got there in the end. And as we looked to our right, there they were. So if you look at the photo a little bit closer, you'll see that my eyes are fixed on them. And you can see that my brother goes, there they are. Oh, how glorious the finish of the Comrades Marathon. Because it took us a long time to get there. But you guys know what carried us through? Is the support next to the road. The fact that we knew before we started in Peter Maritzburg, we will see them next to the road. At Cato Ridge, 30 kilometers in. Gillets, 60 kilometers in. And the finish, 88.7 kilometers in. They told us that they'll be there. And that makes all the difference. I'm telling you now, and I've said this before, if I go and run the Comrades Marathon now, today, I'll never make it. Because we need 100,000 people cheering us on next to the road to get to the end. No one will be able to do it on their own. Because it's just so tough. But because there are people cheering for you, rooting for you, promising you that they'll be next to the road, that carries you through to the end. Oh, how glorious the finish. That is a phenomenal feeling because it was all worth it. Eight hours and 25 minutes of running, we crossed the finish line. It was all worth it. It was really tough at some sections. But I knew that the finish was going to be great. That's what Jude wants. Jude wants his brothers and sisters to finish. He wants his brothers and sisters to go over the finish line in glory. This is what he wants for his people. It's just the illustration. I'm not saying that Jude wants everyone to run the comrades, okay? I'm just saying he wants everyone to finish the race and to finish it strong. Jude starts his prayer in the end by saying, that is who God is. He's the one who will carry you through to the end. And because he is that, he's worthy to be praised for that. Because he doesn't leave us alone. He is with us. Fam. When you start in Peter Maritzburg on the Comrades Marathon, the people next to the road make all the difference. Jude says, God didn't say, take care now, bye bye then, I'll see you someday. He said, I'll wait for you, right there at the end. And here's what I know, for us as Christians, our hope of eternal life means one thing, the day is coming and Jesus will be there. That's what it means. And because we'll see him at the end, we faithfully strive to finish the race. Do you know what else you can praise God for? Look at the highlights in the text. He's a Savior. He's Lord. He's got glory. Come on now. The one that fixes. The one that rules. Glory, right? He's the weighty one. You like you feel His presence. Majesty. Just standing in awe of Him. He's the one with the power. He's the one with authority. And not only sometimes, maybe, but all time, now and forever. Like if you're looking for something to praise God for, those words are of a great help. Why? Because when we gaze at those words, when we realize their meaning, when we experience God in that way, then we become enamored with Him. Enamored is different than infatuation. Infatuation is like a temporary feeling. Enamored means a continuous state of being. And God gets bigger and bigger and bigger in our heads, in our hearts, and in our beings as we think about the fact that He's Savior, and that He's Lord, and that He's got glory, and that He's got majesty, and that He's got power, and that He's got all the authority. He gets bigger and bigger and clearer and clearer. You know, if you go stargazing, Marie and I did that in Sutherland in 2014, they give you a telescope to look at stars. Here's the crazy thing about a telescope. It doesn't make the stars bigger. It also doesn't make the moon bigger. It just brings it way closer to you so that you can see it clearer. That's what praise does to us. The more we praise God, it doesn't change Him, His being, and His awesomeness. 
When we praise God, it brings Him closer to us so that we can see Him clearer, so that we can marvel at it even more. I mean, you can look up at the stars with the naked eye. It's beautiful. You can look at the full moon and go, yeah, yeah that's great. The moment you look through it, or you look at it through a telescope, something happens inside of you because you see it clearer. That's what praise does, fam. So that is how we keep ourselves in God's love. Which one of these resonate with you today? Intimacy with God, intimacy with others, or praise? I just want you to sit with that for a minute. Which one resonates? And will you respond this morning by asking God to help you with this? Because this is what He wants for us. He wants to have intimacy with us. He wants us to have intimacy with one another. And He wants our praise. You know that you can ask Him to help you with it. God, I really struggle with this. Please help me. To end off the book of Jude, I want to read you a reflection on the word majesty written by Pastor Ryan Britt from the Church of 1122. Will you look at it with me? It'll be on the slides. Listen to who we are called to have intimacy with. This is what he says. To be near Him is to be alive. To be His is to be immortal. He is unending beyond time, never changing in character nor intention, incomprehensible in mercy, and more available to His children than gravity is to the earth. He did not begin when the beginning began, but He began the beginning. He did not start when start started. He started start. At a word, he brought forth day and night, land and sea, and all things that crawl, swim, and fly. He leaned in and breathed the life of an eternal soul into his prized creation, and up from the dirt came his image, staring back at him, reflecting him to his creation, just as the moon reflects the sun. His love never fails, and his hope endures forever. It is with gladness he does all things, and there is nothing that runs deeper through the veins of creation than His grace. His purpose is undeniable and His mission is unwavering. It is in Him, through Him, for Him, by Him, and to Him that all things have been created, were created. He can't be stopped, won't be forgotten, and shall never be moved nor forsaken. His name is above every name on earth and in heaven, and he has set a feast for his family that will forever be their joy. He has no fear, he has no shame, he is guilty of nothing, and he will always finish what he starts. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, all-loving, and good. He is tenacious in dispensing his grace. He is ferocious in battle, undefeated, irrevocable, and supreme in all his ways. He is majesty. That is the God we serve. Let's pray. Father God, we believe that this is who you are. And for that, we give you praise. Our Savior, our Lord, the glorious one, the majestic one, the powerful one, the one with authority, the one who is and was and is to come. The one who has all of this through all of time, now and forever. Father God, when we, when we understand you in this way, when we gaze at you in this way, when you become clearer in our hearts and minds in this way, all we want to do is respond to you. So we want to run to you and have intimacy with you. We want to praise you. And Father God, we want to keep ourselves in your love. Will you help us? Will you help us, Father God, through your Holy Spirit and through the ministry of your body to stay hidden in your love? so that we can finish well. Father God, we want to reach the end, and we know you'll be there, and we know that you're cheering us on. We know that you've given us all the grace we need to finish this wonderful race that you've called us to run. So Father God, I pray that you would hide us in your love, that you would keep us there, and that we would keep ourselves there. I pray that in your name.
Amen.